that Your Honors convict General Perisic on all counts in the indictment and that you impose a sentence of life for the commission of those crimes. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. Mr. Duke. Your Honors, Mr. Gregor Guy Smith will be the first to address the court. That is how we have divided our. Just a moment, please. We're just doing a quick podium transfer, Your Honor, and then I'll be ready to speak. No problem at all. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Kaismith, except that there is an echo that I'm hearing. It's, so am I. It's, it's not coming through here because I hear it even when I remove the ear. I don't know what noise that is. Proceed, Mr. Kaisman. Thank you so much. Uh, initially, I would um, like to echo the thanks that was I'm sorry about that. Not a problem, not a problem at all. Initially, I would like to echo the thanks that was um, given by Mr. Harmon to all of the participants who work at this institution, who have worked uh, with us during this trial. Some of you we know by name. Many of you we know by face. All of you have been invaluable to these proceedings. Um, I would like to thank, um, and I'm sure that it, it's one of the difficulties that one has when we list those that we thank. I, I, you always inevitably forget somebody, and I'm positive that um, both the prosecution and the defense uh, are equally grateful to those that transcribe our words. Uh, put them down on paper so that um, they can be read um, however wise or foolish they may be. And I also would like to thank Dee Montgomery who has worked uh, with the defense for some considerable time. I was actually uh, struck yesterday in terms of some of the conversation that was had. Um, I don't know to what extent we will be involved in some of that same conversation, um, but 
one of the matters that came about, um, I thought needed some comment. I'm an officer of the court, as all of these people on both sides of the aisle are, and we believe in the law. We may disagree about it. You may dispute the interpretation of it, but we believe in it. There would be no law if there was no precedent. And we believe in precedent. And we rely on precedent to present our cases to you. Without precedent, we would have no guidance. Without precedent, without the Nuremberg cases, without those situations that existed historically, and without those analogies that are drawn presently, we would not be in a position to comment on, or indeed, to figure out the difficult questions that are presented in these institutions. We believe in a foundation of values, rules, and regulations, which we trust and hope all people live by. Once again, without the benefit of history, um, I don't think my grandfather was the first person to say it. I don't believe that when I say it to my grandchildren, I will be the last. But if we do not learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. And I was somewhat concerned yesterday that there was an attitude voiced that each and every time that a case is tried, it is tried tabula rasa. I hope that is not the sentiment. I trust that is not the manner in which this chamber will engage in its deliberations. If it was, then I would be remiss at this point in not making a motion to strike all of the adjudicated facts that have been introduced. Now, I don't think that that would be reasonable. I don't think that that would be sensible. Nor do I believe that, that would be logical. When dealing with the kinds of cases that present themselves here, we deal with the unfortunate backdrop of a war. And although flowers do bloom in a war, that's not what we usually pay attention to. May, may I just interrupt you a little bit? Uh, I, are you done with the concept of precedent? I just want to make a comment. Sure. I just want to make a comment sure. that much as, uh, and you indicated that we all officers of the law, and uh, much as we, we learn from precedent and history, we also do create precedent. I am in absolute agreement with you. Thank you. You may proceed. Um, and I think we would agree, um, and Mr. Harmon has actually alluded to this, that this is a unique case and a unique situation, um, which perhaps we'll talk about a bit 
uh, later in terms of some of the ideas. But I think we, we would agree that when new law is created, that law is predicated upon the rich tradition of precedent. It may depart from it. It may evolve. It may revolutionize the law. But it does not discount it, and it does not disregard it. And a careful analysis requires that which has come before us. Because in this absence, we would, of course, be reinventing the wheel, which I don't think any of us wish to do. I was discussing for a moment the issue of war and uh, that when the gods of war unleashed, which is what occurred here, which is what brings us here, that the fragile fabric that we all cherish that keeps order is indeed torn asunder. And after those wars are completed in whatever fashion they are completed and peace is achieved, we attempt to make sense of what occurred and we attempt to place some semblance of order in a chaotic time. Now, if that was all that we were doing here, and this was only a matter of history, um, our task would be, in many senses, easier. But as a matter of fact, what the task is here, primarily, is to make a determination on the guilt or the innocence of General Parasage. And in that regard, we have a system that requires a very simple but exacting standard. And that standard is the prosecution must establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. What does that mean? In Marditch, it was defined as follows. There is no reasonable explanation of the evidence other than the guilt of the accused. And measured against that exacting burden of proof, it is clear that the prosecution here cannot prove that its interpretations are entirely plausible, let alone that they are the only reasonable explanations of the evidence. And the reason that I am spending some time here in terms of what is the job at hand is because we have been in trial for a long time. And we have seen an astounding amount, weight, of evidence. But that in and of itself does not prove a case. And with regard to the evidence that has been received, it is important to recall that much of the evidence, as Mr. Harmon indicated, and we certainly agree on this point, and we agree on many others, was documentary evidence, written words, open to interpretation 
And the reason that is of importance from the outset to remember and to think about is that you are tasked, the three of you, with having to interpret those words. The prosecution's view may be attractive or may not. But if there are two explanations, plausible explanations, one which points to guilt and the other which points to innocence, you must adopt that which points to innocence. That is your job. That is your duty. That is of the law. With that in mind, I think it is extremely important and uh, we ask that you very, very carefully review the prosecution's final brief and final argument to determine whether or not they have actually applied the right burden of proof to the arguments that they advance. And as I'm sure you are aware, it needs not be dwelled upon each of the elements of the crimes that they have charged must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, because much of the evidence that you have is circumstantial evidence, evidence which is open to an inference, the question becomes, in terms, once again, of your analysis, whether or not the evidence that has been presented by the prosecution, because they bear the burden, we bear no burden, is complete, or whether or not it involves cherry picking. Now cherry picking is a term which is used and, and I think it's used so often that it's many times people um, have it go in one ear and out the other because it seemed to be um, kind of an unpleasant accusation of what a party may have done. But actually it's something much more profound. Cherry picking is the act of pointing at an individual case or piece of data that seems to confirm a particular position while ignoring a portion of related cases or data that may contradict that position. And with regard to the duty of the prosecution, um, not only to see that justice is done, but also to maintain its burden of proof, the act of cherry picking is an act in which their burden is lessened. It also falls victim to being trying to figure out the kindest way of putting this. I suppose it would be to say that it falls victim to a number of what are considered to be logical fallacies. And we have seen that in this case. And I will speak to a number of those issues momentarily. Lastly, just in terms of thinking about how to analyze the evidence before you, 
one of the things that we have seen happen a fair amount um, involves another logical fallacy. And that logical fallacy is simply as follows. Just because there is a correlation between two matters does not mean that there is causation. The simplest one that um, I've thought of presenting is there's certainly a correlation between an ordinary alarm clock ringing and daybreak. There is no causal relationship between these two phenomena. And there have been a number of occasions, um, both in the arguments made today, as well as those arguments made in the brief, where that logical fallacy, which is known in Latin, which we speak about here every once in a while, as cum hoc ergo propter hoc, has been vigorously pursued. In the context of what we have heard, it is critical to remember that this case is not static. And the evidence that was presented to you was evidence that came from a highly dynamic situation, a situation that was in flux. From the beginning of the difficulties before Parasich's tenure through the Dayton Peace Accord, the parties involved in this conflict took different positions maintained different interests and had different agendas. And specifically in that regard, Fry, the government for which General Perisic was working as the chief of staff of the military, had distinct political and strategic differences from that of the Republic of Srpska and the Republic of Srpska, Kraina, I know at the time. Complete your point. I can stop there. We'll take a break and come back at half a straight off call again. Thanks for the